All right, so glad to see everybody. But I'd like to start out asking you a few questions. Are you excited about your faith? Are you on fire for Christ? Do you want God to work in your life and through you? Do you want him to lead you and guide you? So when we're presented with these questions, kind of rhetorical, but the honest answer is yes, of course. But how many times in our lives do our actions prove the exact opposite? Why is it we get so distracted with our own desires? Why do we say we want to live for God, but then turn around and we live for ourselves? How many times have we been sitting in church and all that's on our minds is, oh, how much longer is this guy going to talk? Or my personal favorite, what's for lunch? See, maybe you're distracted because the football game's on, you're missing it. You're wondering, how's that team doing? Or maybe you have plans later to hang out with your friends or a project that just really needs to be completed before the snow comes. Why is it so easy to live selfishly? See, I know I struggle with this. When I need to prepare for a sermon, the week before, I'm deep in the Word. I'm studying. I'm excited about what God's doing. I'm excited about what the passage is saying. But on the off weeks, sometimes I don't even touch my Bible. It just sits there. I get too busy at work, the chores that are at home. Or I'm watching YouTube, hanging out with friends. So hopefully you're better at this than me. And maybe it's not really a problem for you. But then nonetheless, be careful. Because it's so easy to let God take that back seat in your life. To skip church, for example. I know I struggled with this one a lot. And maybe it's because something came up, or I wanted to go hunting. <clears throat> maybe I needed a break this week. That list, it goes on and on of our excuses. Let's be honest. I've done it. You've done it. We're all plenty guilty of this. And there's been times in my life I just didn't want to go to church. I just didn't want to serve God. And obviously, just because you skip church once, you're not doomed. No, what I'm saying is that it's easy to drift away. It's easy to not let God in control of your life. And it's honestly something that I've struggled with a lot. And I think if we're all honest, we can identify in our own lives parts or maybe a bunch of these things that we've struggled with as well. But today we're in Nehemiah chapter 9, and as we look at that, we see that the people, they're confessing their sins, and they're turning back to God. The walls, they've been rebuilt. Jerusalem's looking like a real city, finally. We're no longer seeing these walls being built, but rather the rebuilding of the people. And as Mike showed us in chapter 8, the people, they gathered together, and the law was read, God's word was read, and it was explained to them for approximately six hours on that first day. It's a really long time to stand there. Think of it this way, though. See, the people, they'd been scattered and separated from that exile. The exile that occurred because of their disobedience. See, these people, they grew up in a foreign land with a foreign ruler. They didn't have the temple or priests to show them the way. And unlike you and me, there wasn't a Bible on their bookshelf. See, many of the requirements of the law, what God required them to follow, were abandoned or forgotten during this captivity. But now we have the people, they're gathered together, and they have the privilege of having Scripture not only read to them, but explained. I think that this would have been a really awesome event, eye-opening for some, convicting for others. So in chapter 8, 
It ends with the people rejoicing and the people more, learning more and more about God. Let's look at Nehemiah 8, verse 18. And it says, And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God. They kept the feast seven days, and on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. We start to see a revival in Jerusalem. God's people, they're starting to obey his commands. They're starting to get excited about following God. They had slipped away, but they've turned back. They're turning back to God. And honestly, that's something that's really easy in our own lives, isn't it? To slip away. I can identify with the Israels here for sure. See, I may not go out and make a physical idol that I'm going to bow down and worship to, like the Israelites did once or twice. But where I spend my time shows what's really important in my life. The people now, though, they're turning back to God. They're trying to put Him first. And Scripture, it has this type of effect on our lives. See, the Israelites started to follow God and the law, and they started to obey Him after the Scripture was read. The Bible can have this huge impact when it is absorbed and taken into our hearts. The Israelites, they started taking the Scripture into their hearts. So this brings us to chapter 9, and it starts off with a slightly bit more of a somber tone. But Nehemiah 9 verse 1 says, Now on the 24th day of this month, the people of Israel were assembled with fasting and in sackcloth and with earth on their heads. So being presented with the law and having scripture not only read but also explained to the people of Israel has brought them to an important part in their lives. See, they've real, they realize now that they need to fully trust and rely on God. They need to turn to him, and they need to start by asking for forgiveness. So they've assembled with fasting, in sackcloth, and with earth on their heads. And see, all three of these things were symbols that showed the absolute seriousness of the people and their humility before God. Let's look at verse 2 now. And the Israelites separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and the iniquities of their fathers. So the people are separating themselves from foreigners. Seems a little strange at first, but they're not doing it because they think they're better than other people. They're doing it because they want to follow God. And following God means being vastly different than the world. We like to think that the world doesn't affect us. That we can go against those bad influences in our lives. That maybe we can change people. But many times, it's us that are drugged down and changed, isn't it? It's far easier to tear someone down than it is to build them up. And this is what the world can do in our lives. And that is why Israel separated themselves. Not because they were better, but because they wanted to be different. They wanted to live for God, and they didn't want to get drugged down by the world. And if we look at Israel's own history, we'll see how true this is. When they followed God, when they pursued him, when they separated themselves from the practices of the world, they obeyed, they followed God, they stayed true. But when they started following worldly practices, when they let that into their lives, they wandered astray and they disobeyed God. So not only do we see now, though, that Israel, they've turned around, they're starting to follow God. They've separated themselves. They're confessing their sins and the sins of their fathers. So confessing your own sins, that makes sense. When I've messed up, I ask for forgiveness. I confess. That makes sense. But why would you confess the sins of someone else? It's a little confusing, isn't it? See... The people had come from a sinful past. 
And in a way, they were also guilty of their ancestors' sins because they were participating in similar practices. And that does kind of make sense, though. If you're brought up in sin and you don't know any other way, what is the easiest route to follow? Continue in that sin, because that's all you know. And also, in their culture, it was common practice to glorify their forefathers, glorify those ancestors. So in confessing their own sin and the, the, and the sins of the past, the people, they were taking ownership. They essentially were saying, we've messed up, and those who came before us have as well. Please forgive us so that we can obey you, so that they can obey God and follow him. Let's look at verse 3 now. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter of it, they made confession and worshiped the Lord their God. So half of the day is dedicated to God and to learning his laws and his commandments. This rededication to following God's laws was on a national scale. Hearts and lives were being changed. The people, they were refocusing their, themselves and their lives on following God. And that's exactly what God wants for these people and in our lives as well. We aren't to become Christians simply to avoid hell. Being a Christian isn't merely fire insurance. Following God is a change of life. And we can't sit idly by in that, in that faith either. Many times I mess up on this, just like Israel. However, in this chapter, we can also be like Israel. We can confess our sins. We can rededicate our lives to following God. Why is that so difficult? I want to do my own thing so often. I don't want to be inconvenienced. I just want to live my life and have a good time, right? It's a struggle. But the Christian life is about following God and obeying Him. And that honestly can be very conflicting. I want to follow God. I want to serve Him. I want to be deep in His Word. I want to do what He wants in my life. But I want life to be carefree and easy. I want it to go according to my schedule. I want to be the one who's in control. Living for Christ, though, is about surrendering what I want, what you want, and doing what He wants in our lives. It's about humbly repenting and surrendering to God. Charles Spurgeon said this, Repentance grows as faith grows. Do not make any mistake about it. Repentance is not a thing of days and weeks. A temporary penance to be gotten over as fast as possible. No, it is the grace of a lifetime, like faith itself. Repentance is the inseparable companion to faith. It is the grace of a lifetime, the inseparable companion of faith. So no matter where you are in your Christian walk, whether you're a brand new Christian or maybe one who's been around since Nehemiah was building those walls, repentance and following God, they go hand in hand. But along with repentance also is prayer. And as we move further into this chapter, we see that the Israelites, they go to the Lord in prayer. And this prayer perfectly illustrates God's grace and his goodness, even though the, the people of Israel were wicked and turned away from him time and time again. Nehemiah 9, verse 6 says, You are the Lord, you alone. You have made heaven and the heaven of heavens with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them, and you pre preserve them, all of them, and the host of heaven worships you. The 
God is great and he is good. He's made everything, including you and me. And he alone is worthy of our worship and praise. When we pray, we're not talking to a powerless figure. We're talking to the creator of the universe who designed specifically each one of us and who holds such immense power, we can't comprehend it. However, he cares for us, and he really does want what's best in our lives. But we need to trust and we need to follow him. And so this prayer in this chapter, it goes on to explain a number of things. How God chose Abraham, how he delivered the people from slavery in, in Egypt, and it's an excellent summary of Israel's history. And through all of it, God was there for them. He was leading and guiding them and helping them every step of the way. However, if we look at Nehemiah 9, verses 26 and 27, we see that it says this. Nevertheless, they were disobedient and rebelled against you and cast your law behind their back and killed your prophets who had warned them in order to turn them back to you. And they committed great blasphemies. Therefore, you gave them into the hand of their enemies who made them suffer. And in the time of their suffering, they cried out to you and you heard from them from heaven. And according to your great mercies, you gave them saviors who saved them from the hand of their enemies. God is good and he is gracious, but sin does not go unpunished. See, God was there to help Israel and to lead them every single step of the way. But they turned their backs from, on him and they blatantly disobeyed him. But once the people were willing to repent, he was gracious. God was gracious and willing to forgive. Verses 30 through 31. Many years you bore with them and warned them by your spirit through your prophets, yet they would not give ear. Therefore you gave them into the hands of the peoples of the lands. Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end of them or forsake them, for you are a gracious and merciful God. So this section, verses 30 and 31, kind of highlights those events before the exile. Israel, once again, they turned away from God, and it was no surprise that they were disobeying his commandments. But God was patient with his people, and they still refused to listen to him. He'd warned them time and time again. All they had to do was turn back, rededicate themselves to God. But they refused, so punishment followed. Yet in their punishment, I would say that God still showed grace and mercy. He had every right to wipe out this group of people because they sinned yet again, even though he gave them chance after chance. He could have said, I'm sick and tired of you disobeying, and now it's over. That's it. They're gone. But he didn't. No, Israel was severely punished, but they were allowed to remain. And God wants nothing more for his people than to have them willingly follow him. He's slow to anger, full of grace and mercy. All we need to do is repent and turn to him. See, even in my own life, I feel like I mess up time and time again. But isn't it comforting to know that even though I mess up, God's still going to forgive me? But even though God is gracious and he will forgive give us, it doesn't give us a blatant excuse to continue to sin. Paul talks about this very thing in Romans. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 16. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? 
So we need to strive to follow God and to obey him. And just like here in Romans, if we follow sin, it's our master. But if we pursue righteousness, then that is our master. And sin leads to death. Following God and righteousness, it leads to life. And it seems like such a simple choice, doesn't it? So easy. But it may be the hardest struggle that we face on a daily basis. Thankfully, we have a merciful God that even though we mess up time and time again, he'll still forgive us. Nehemiah 9, verse 33. Yet you have been righteous in all that has come upon us, for you have dealt faithfully, and we have acted wickedly. Even though the people, they had disregarded God's law and they had acted wickedly, God remained faithful. And this is one aspect of God that is truly amazing. No matter what happens, he's going to remain faithful, true, just, and many, many, many more attributes. See, God never changes. He's always there for us. We just need to rely on him. Let's look at verse 38. Because of all this, we made a firm covenant in writing on the sealed documents or the name of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. So the people of Israel, after all these things in their past history, after just coming out of this exile... They're turning back to God. They're rededicating their lives, and they were taking it extremely seriously. Up to this point, the law, it had been read. It had been explained. The people had worshipped. They confessed their sins, but now they go a step further. They put into writing their dedication to the Lord. They made it a public and permanent statement. They were going to follow God. It was a renewal of their obedience. And the word used here for covenant, it's not the usual word that you find. It's slightly less common. And this word, it emphasizes faithfulness. Faithfulness was something that the Israelites struggled with in the past. But the people, they wanted to change this. They wanted to be faithful to God. So they made a pledge, a covenant to prove their dedication and their sincerity. I worked at Victory Bible Camp for many summers. And while I was there, I remember the excitement, the passion for God that you would see. You could see it in the staff, and then at the end of each week, you'd see it in the campers. People were excited for God. They wanted to live for Him. There was fire there. But as the summer drug on, people would get tired. Some of that excitement that they had at the beginning, some of that fire, it would start to fade away. I remember personally when I was a camper myself, I came back from our week of camp and I was excited. I wanted to follow God. I wanted to do something for Christ. And I remember writing about it in my journal, the only entry in that journal. But I wanted to write in it. And I wrote, and I said, I'm excited. I want to serve God. I want to follow him. I want to do all of these things. I remember that. It was just, it was overflowing. I was excited to follow Christ. But as the weeks went by, and I got back into my usual routine, that passion started to disappear. I started to do my own thing, and soon God took a back seat in my life. What had happened? I was still a good person. Nothing had really changed. No life-shattering events. But that passion, that fire for God, it faded away. Living for Christ is tricky because it's so much easier to live for yourself. And this is exactly like the Israelites. And it's easy to see because we have that benefit of hindsight. We can look at everything that they've done. What were you guys thinking? They would follow God, then they would turn back and do their own thing. Time and time again, it was like an endless cycle. But there are people just like you and me. 
And we honestly can slip into these exact same patterns if we're not careful. However, we should also be like the Israelites, specifically in this chapter. They heard the word of God and they responded. They gathered together, they confessed their sins, and they made a covenant to change their ways and to stay true to God. Now, of course, that didn't stop them from down the road sinning or messing up once again. But it was a huge change that shifted from living for themselves to living for God. And this is an important step that I think is so easily missed or forgotten. The worries in our lives can so easily take over, and we forget to live for God. We forget to stay passionate for Christ, or we simply don't read the Bible anymore, and we just go on with our day. We should follow the example that we found in this chapter and live for Christ wholeheartedly. So maybe that comes in the form of recommitting yourself to God. Maybe you've started to wander or possibly even turned your back on God, just like Israel did. Right now is the perfect time to confess those sins, to turn your life around, to start following Christ. Maybe you've been in church all your life, and it's hard for you to get excited about God's word and serving him. Maybe some of that spark has faded. You're just living your life day by day, doing your own thing. Go to God. Get into his word. Learning more about our God and King and digging deep into the scriptures that can help reignite that passion. Just like Israel. Once they started reading the law, things started to change. Lives and hearts were changed and moved. And if you find it difficult to get this process started, or you have no clue where to begin, or even how to study the Bible at all, there are people here who can help you. We'd love to help you. Reading God's Word and understanding it can be two completely different things. You can read the words on the page, but it just doesn't ever sink in. But if you understand them, it can sink in. And it takes that studying, that digging into the Scriptures to fully appreciate all that it has to offer. Or maybe you're listening to me right now and you're wondering where all of this is coming from. Maybe you don't struggle with any of this. I encourage you to keep up the good work. But please, use some of that passion to help others. Because we're not as good at it as you are. It's so easy to backslide and start relying on yourself instead of on God. And so we need to help each other. We need to encourage each other so that we can follow God wholeheartedly. Let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to stay passionate for you and your word, that you would spark a fire in our lives so that we could serve you boldly, Lord. Help us to be like Israel in this chapter. They repented and turned back to you after many years of wandering astray. Help us to turn back to you that we wouldn't backslide into those old habits, that we'd live 100% committed to you, Lord. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for being patient with us, even though we mess up time and time again. Lord, you're amazing, and I want to live my life for you wholeheartedly. Help us to do that, Lord. Amen.